Hey, Will. I did not hear you come in. Um, I'm doing my show. I'm supposed to meet Rick here. He is not here, as you can tell. Well, I don't know. Sometimes he's sneaky and creepy. Nope, he's not here. I heard he was uh, hanging out with his old news friends. I feel left out. Al Peterson, Aaron Bruce. They're going back. Some uh, old KEZI trips. He's going to go, I think, uh, fly fishing and ride on a sand buggy. He did not bring me. Um, but they did a whole story on it. And apparently he'd rather hang out with them than me. So we're going to go ahead and start the show without him. This is the Rick Dancer Show featuring Emma. I'm not dead. That sounds like something interesting. <laughs> It's officially time to get to uh, the first segment, the first story. Rick's still not here. That's not a big surprise. They uh, went to Sun River. It's a whole half hour special on Sun River. You're going to love this, especially because the first story is Rick <laughs> with brown hair. Weird, right? And uh, he borrowed uh, some clown pants, apparently, that go up here, and he can wear them in the water as he tries to fly fish. I have to see this. Let's watch. <laughs> <laughs> I call this my, my cave. I'm in my cave. Bob Gavilio is a man fish fear the most. He's a teacher, a fisherman, a dream maker. I love this. A dangerous combination. Life comes through here. It's pretty cool. And it's uh, the people that are coming in here are all excited about things. And I think it's good for people to do this. They're people in search of something to take their mind off everyday life. People will sit and work for lots of hours, and then they're all of a sudden they're... Uh, you know, they were, they've got time that they want to go do something. They dream about doing this. For 22 years... I taught the advanced placement classes in uh, social sciences. Bob taught school and coached kids. I didn't want to retire from something. I wanted to continue on. So I tried to figure out, well, okay, if I'm going to retire from teaching, what would I do? Thought about it, and I thought, well, I'll probably be working in a fly shop. So he started the Sun River Fly Shop. He never has retired, just changed careers. Sort of. <laughs> the secret is, smile a lot. <laughs> Bob is a man who helps guys who don't know how create memories. We all seek that. He makes you get into the part. You're going to lift your forearm like that. Stretch yourself a bit. It's just your wrist about 45 degree angle, and when you close it and shut it, it, it casts. Even if others laugh. Where's the love? <laughs> You'll like me when I'm catching dinner, young lady. Fly fishing is about adventure. I can remember the first reel I caught. Risk taking 101. And here we are just battling this fish down, and I don't even know how to play the line very well. It's you and that pole. Finally, I get this fish in, and I'll, I'll never forget that. That's one of my first fish. And those memories. It's amazing how many people will remember their first fishing trip. Bring your hand up, everything about it, and then just 45 degrees close. There you go. But they probably don't remember a whole lot about a lot of other things they did that year. So whatever it is, it stamps you. Bob knows how to make it easy. No big rules, just... Well, you're motivating people. And if you don't motivate people, well then, you know, they give things up. He wants you to enjoy what he's enjoyed for so many years. And we go places all over the world with fly fishing, and that's pretty cool. Every one of them is different, even if you do the same one twice, three, four, five times. He wants you to catch the bug and the fish to grab the fly. That's the connection that makes a fly fisherman. People's behavior can change when they move out into this stuff. It calms them down, they're more excited about things. They're not thinking about some of their other problems. No deadlines, no complaints, nothing. Just you and that fish. Somebody's teasing somebody, but I won't say who. <laughs> Bob understands something about people. He reads you. He knows when you walk into his shop that you need something. Something an old school teacher, a fly, and a pole can give you. You gotta stick that hook right in them. 
There you go. Got it. I you got, got it. it. Very nice. Oh God, Very nice. Well, no, just relax. Just yeah. relax. Let him fight around. Keep your rod tip up so he's bending the rod, and that's what tires him. Very nice. Very nice. Thanks, Bob. Dr. Frybeer. I didn't know you were a swimmer. Hi, Rick. How you doing? How long have you been swimming? Oh, I've been swimming my whole life. Yeah. Hey, do you got time I can ask you a question about prostate cancer? Yeah, sure. Can you cure prostate cancer? Oh, sure. Prostate cancer can be cured all the time. I hear that from guys, though. I hear them saying, I I've heard prostate cancer can't be cured. That's absolutely not true. So prostate cancer can be cured with radiation or cured with surgery. As long as it's localized, as long as it doesn't spread, we can cure prostate cancer. Is that what scares a lot of guys the most when they find out they have it, that this is not curable when it's, in fact, one of the most curable cancers out there? Well, it is, yeah, and uh, they, need to, they need to find out about that and find out about their option. Because, you know, sometimes, and this is a little strange, sometimes prostate cancer, even though it can be cured, doesn't need to be cured. Because prostate cancer is so slow growing that, depending on a guy's age and his other medical problems, sometimes we make the decision to not do any treatment, even though we could. And that's where we have to individualize, and that's where he needs to go in and talk to his doctor and find out about his case. Okay, you probably need to finish your laps. We've been talking too yeah, long, and I know how it is. It's nice to talk to you, too. See you later, Dave. Did you know that one in three American children start kindergarten without the skills they need to read? But it doesn't have to be that way. We, 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 we did, did it with the man. With the man. Oh, you did the man one. My name is Corey Byers, and I teach the early literacy program at the Eugene Hearing and Speech Center. It gave him kind of a, an edge up on everything else. He went into school confident and knowing what the teacher was talking about. They um, teach me how to read little words and then start to read bigger words. And it was way, and it got really easier. He was even able to help other children um, sitting next to him that had had no prior schooling experience. I really feel like our program and what I do for a job really impacts the child for their entire life. Big armadillos. Because we give them this foundation that they can build on for their entire life. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, I'll use that. Uh, hey, Emma here. You might be wondering why I am in a radio station and also why Rick's not here. I don't know why Rick's not here, but I do work on Alternative 1037 KNRQ, 6 to 10 in the morning. Find me here on the morning show. And I do KZL from 10 to 2. I live on the air, and I apologize for that if you hear me all the time. Uh, still waiting on Rick, but we are doing a story about Sun River. It's great. We just saw him fly fishing. That was fun. Al Peterson takes over next. He did a story about roundabouts when they came to Sun River, and we all know about roundabouts. Sun River, man, what a place. You can golf, you can fish, you can hike, you can ski, you can do just about anything. But to do it, you got to get around. And to get around, you got to figure out the circles. America, America was built on the grid. Streets crossing other streets at perfect right angles. Go right, go left, go straight. No need to think, the traffic lights will do it for you. Oh, but Sun River. In Sun River, it's different. Uh, the circles of Sun River, the mystical circles, huh? Yep, that's them. No stoplights here, very few stop signs. The traffic circles. The traffic circles rule the road. Well, you got to go to circle one. First circle, you get to take the third exit. And you're going to take the first right out. The next, take the second exit. From circle 10 to 11. When you get to circle one, you ignore the first exit, take the second exit. The next one, you take the first exit. Then you look for our street. And you'll get right there. Each circle connects three or four roads. They take you to all those pretty places in Sun River, including the beautiful old officers club from the Camp A. But the circles, you got to learn them. We're staying on uh, Yellow Pine. Go to circle three, follow that around. Look for circle four, head to circle four. Uh, Yellow Pine's about the third right, in between circle four and circle five. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, come on, Al, these are just round. They've been around for thousands of years. The ancient Romans used them. What's the big deal? You know what? I like roundabouts. These ones are just a little bit different. Uh -oh. 
every other roundabout I've ever seen, you could see across the middle. So that even as you got into the circle, you could look across the circle and you knew where you were going to turn. Here, the middle of the circle is so full of trees, you can't see anything. So yeah, if you have to turn, the turn is there, but you don't see it until you're right on top of it. Flip some roof. Kelly Mann's a professional barbecue and a lost traveler's best friend. People come in, they say, I'm off of circle four. I'm like, well, then just follow the numbers. When you get to circle one, take the exit that says circle two. When you get to circle two, take the exit that says circle three. When you get to circle three, you'll get there. But things go very wrong, especially after dark. There are no easily identified street signs in dark. You can't, you can't see. I get lost at nighttime here. If you don't know exactly where you're going, it does get kind of confusing. And did we mention that the circles don't always line up the way you'd expect. Most circles, like if you're coming from circle one to say circle four, that all follows chronologically. But after that, you know, you can go from circle four to, to 11, and you're like, oh, how does that work? Confused? Well, find a question mark, pull over, pull out the, pull out your hair. At nighttime, they're called domers, because everybody stops and hits their dome light. So why do they do this anyway? Well, stop and think about it for a minute. The developer thought this was a beautiful place. And one of the ideas is he wanted it to be like the Deschutes River, very windy. I like there's no stop lights or stop signs, and there's not a lot of traffic. And so you keep going in one direction, and always beautiful pines to look at. I love it. I'm living in the forest. How could you not love it? Yeah, the old grid system is it is efficient, but doesn't take over just about everything. The Sun River circles, on the other hand, not quite as easy to use, but boy, they're sure easy on the eyes. And it's that attitude that keeps Sun River so serene. Al Peterson, KEZI 9 News. We're here with Lale Razai, and we're going to tell you about an event that's coming up, a movie, and then a conversation we're going to start here in Eugene to help some very important people in Iran. Yes, we can do that. Here in Eugene, we can actually help. Thank you for being here with us to tell us about this. Thank you so much, Rick, for having me. And so this movie really tells the story of the Baha'is, the history of persecution, and also the latter part of the movie deals with the formation of this uh, university, the underground university, kind of an informal university, that was formed to help the Baha'i students who were denied access to higher education. Because right now in Iran, if you're Baha'i, if you're of the Baha'i faith, you are not allowed to go to university and, and be educated. Absolutely correct. And education is one of the things that are denied Baha'is, but Baha'is cannot even have any um, jobs. They're, they are not allowed to work for government jobs. They're denied their pensions. The burial grounds are desecrated. Baha'i children in elementary school are ridiculed by their teachers openly. Uh, Baha'i businesses have been closed. Um, homes and businesses are, you know, they can be vandalized. There is many that have been burned to the ground without any penalty for the perpetrators. So you see, that's what's happening. Denial of education is one. And the response of the Baha'i community, which I think should give hope to all of mankind, is to come up with something like BIHE, which is a ray of hope that in the face of such persecution, you can have such constructive response and that peaceful. doesn't and peaceful that does not involve violence or uh, or strife, and that's I think and it actually brings the whole community together from teachers to students as you saw. So, what makes you saddest about this? Well, that's a very emotional question for me. What makes me the saddest? I'm sad because I feel like. Um, they don't have a voice for themselves. They're working hard, but we need to be their voice, so that gives me strength. But I am sad that, my, um, that a country of Iran, which was one of the greatest civilizations of the world, can have such a situation where human rights can be denied solely on religious belief. So um, that saddens me a lot. But as we talk, there's also a lot of hope so this gives me hope and the support of our communities, the support of my uh, friends and family and colleagues in Eugene and wonderful people such as yourself brings a lot of hope. The hope really is from, this movie was made by a filmmaker who's not a Baha'i, who is just someone who's advocating for human rights. So I think when the situation, when the revolution happened in 1979, that first decade, 
It had so, the persecution was so acute, 200 Baha'is were executed. And we are seeing again a rise in persecution, but the people of Iran are becoming very aware. And I think that's where the ray of hope is, is that I have wonderful friends, Iranian friends, who are very concerned, who are not Baha'is about the situation. We have lots of supporters within the people of Iran, these wonderful um, Iranian people who themselves are realizing the injustice. And I think that has changed since the beginning of revolution. And this film certainly attests to that. And as you probably see and will see for those who will come to the movie, is that there are a lot of supporters, the historians that are quoted in there, none of them are Baha'is, but they're working in support of Baha'is. And I think that gives the Baha'is lots of hope and the work that we each can do. Why do you think this is so important and what can people in Eugene do about a situation going on in Iran? They should come because I think it will be a wonderful event. We'll have a great discussion. And I know that people in Eugene from living here in the past 19 years and working in this community are wonderful people who are very concerned about others. We've seen that in our community, haven't we? And I think because of that, people should come and and I think they would not only be able to show their support, but think about ways that they can change, even have a voice here in Eugene and change things in our community. We can get out of the box, huh? That's it. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much for being with us. It was a pleasure us. to be with you. Thanks so much. Remember Erin Bruce? She worked with Rick at KEZI 9 News. She also did those Bimark commercials. Very sweet. Uh, she takes you on a little sleigh ride, actual horses and a sleigh. I'm so jealous. Watch. I'm Erin Bruce. We're out at the stables in Sun River, and Mike's about to take us on a one-horse open sleigh ride. This is just one of hundreds of outdoor recreation opportunities that Central Oregon has to offer. He's talking to you. <laughs> he said, this is a peach of a day. Well, Mike. One of the most fantastic ways to experience the beauty of Sun River is to let Mike be your tour guide. Mike, back. Drop four. Mike up. The sleigh ride is a one horse open sleigh, just like the song says, led out by Mike, who's one of our Shire thoroughbred crossies. John Russell owns Sun River Stables. He fell in love with this place the moment he arrived. Who can blame him? Some people call this God's country. And when you're bundled up in the back of an antique European sleigh, it's easy to see why. The views here, I've never had a bad sunset. And it's uh, every day I'm down here at work, I pinch myself. Sun River is surrounded by eight and a half miles of Deschutes River. It's nestled in the Deschutes Forest, and locals say it's sunny here 270 days of the year. I started here at the stables back in 94. Greg Mullinder has been leading sleigh rides and trail rides for over a decade, and he says it never gets old. Especially when the elk swim the river and come across. That's pretty neat to see. Greg has seen river otters, osprey, bald eagles, and even a bear out here. He says it's like being a guest in the middle of the forest. And this is the front row seat. Okay, this is your left, hold son. This is your left rein, this is your right rein. Okay, now tell him to step it up. Step it up, Mike. Step it up. Okay. Oh, dear. For over 30 years, Sun River has offered guests a natural experience in the heart of the Pacific Northwest. This is Oregon's playground, and every time you grab the reins, you'll find a new adventure. This last winter, we've had uh, people from as far as Norway to uh, Japan, and I think what really draws them is the variance, again, of experience. Mike's doing really well. How am I doing, Greg? You're doing just a peach of a job. Mike is one of the best tour guides that Sun River has to offer. And if you're looking for a great way to see all of the beauty of Central Oregon, jump on board a one-horse sleigh and take a ride. In Sun River, I'm Erin Bruce, KEZI 9 News. We give women this ability to connect and to see um, just by sitting in that group that they're not alone. Um, it's not just them. Other people are 
um, other women and um, men too, uh, other people are experiencing the same exact thing. So, so all those lies that they were told, all the stuff that they were told over all those years of that abuse, it in one second, it's shaken to its core. I'm not afraid to, um, to tell other women that if they come here, that they're gonna find help and that they're really gonna be able to start living a life in a different way that they've ever lived. But we need to have that next piece. We need to, we need to let women move forward um, so that they can actually change their lives and develop that independence that they need. And part of that is to be able to connect and see these other women and to know, I mean, from all areas of Eugene and Lane County, all different um, stratospheres of, um, you know, different ethnicities, different, um, you know, economic backgrounds, and they're all there, and they all have the same story. I have a voice in that people care, in that I'm deserving of not being hit and not being belittled is probably one of the biggest gifts I've ever had just being unconditionally loved, and I get that here. Nobody can be quiet what's going on or what's happened. Does no matter what, you have to talk, and you have to say no to the violence, no more. It's really powerful to see someone who's maybe going to group for a while and you, oh, they're going to Lane Community College or they're at U of O or they just started this great job. And, and you're like, wow, I could do that. And so then they get to kind of move past, pay, past that emergency place to that dream place, that hope place. In these three years, I have come so far from where I was. I have a job now. I have a car and my first hand-me-down computer. And they get to see that it's not about you. They have this, this capacity. They can do these things. And that they're so strong, because they are. We know it. We see it every day. We see their strength and their power and their abilities. But they don't always see that in themselves. It's never too late. It's never too late, especially if you have kids. That's how I look at it. I mean, I stayed off and on 18 years. Um, and not just one abusive relationship. And I guess that's the thing I would tell other women. Don't ever be afraid to ask for help. You're better and stronger. Now I'm gonna get that teary thing. Um, you're better and stronger than you know. And so you can just see their self-esteem rising and we can help connect them. And it's just, it is, it is really just an amazing transformation to see. So is there something that they can do to help? You know, when you hear these stories, it's like, Hey, I never thought about letting women's space know when I had a job available. You know, they could do that. Or, um, wow, you know, I wouldn't have an issue renting to someone who was a women's space um, a participant, even though they might not have the best rental history because of their abuser. But yeah, I would rent one of my apartments to them. Maybe I'll let them know. I mean, there are th little things like that that people in our community t can do aside from the helping us with funding, which is always important, they can volunteer and be a part of seeing these transformations themselves. There's a lot of things. You're probably wondering why we're standing out in the middle of a desert doing a story called Our Town on Sun River. Well, there is a little city out here, sort of, complete with its own vehicles. This is the place where the desert rats live. Desert rats. They're not what you think. It's brutal. The heat and the elements, the rocks, everything. John Melsheimer is a professional desert racer. Started me off when I was young, and it's just kind of grown into a full-blown addiction. A 37-year-old husband, father. Just a hard-working guy. Been doing drywall 22 years. Obsessed with dust, dirt, power, and what his truck can get away with. Now, if you're a desert racer, does that make you a desert rat? 
Oh yeah, yeah. So what you do, it's on your brain. His rig floats over the desert at 120 miles an hour. They maneuver anything and everything. Rocks, riverbeds, doesn't matter. Bring it on. Keeping it together, honestly. It's all about finishing. And when you're beating something that badly, you might not finish, you know? So it's always trying to hang it on that line, going as fast as you can go, making smart decisions, and still keeping the truck in one piece, you know? So you see the finish line. You can't win unless you finish. 8,000 class action right now, first in class. Desert racers know JEM racing. They're good. Here's some video from a race a year ago. This Ben team wins big races. They have the lead. It's constant upkeep. Every time you do a race, the truck is stripped totally down. Look for cracks, look for something that's worn out, look for something that you don't, you know what I mean? So the next race, you're all ready. The engine puts out nearly 700 horsepower. Breakdowns happen often. Flat tires are a huge issue, huge. Running through the rocks and popping tires, you got to get out and change them. And that takes a lot of wind out of your sails. But fixing them is quick. This truck is set up for anything. It keeps fresh air blowing in your helmet so you can breathe. Because we have no windshield and dust in your face, you know, it's no good. <laughs> it's super cool. It's what we do. Yeah, I don't, I'm not bored at all. I'm not bored at all. Flying over the bumpy ground at 80 miles an hour is way too much fun. It's a lot of money and a lot of work. I, I don't know. I've just always been passionate about it since I've been really little. John says he's got about $150,000 into just the truck. That doesn't count all the other stuff you need to get this thing to the races. So what makes you do it? Adrenaline. Just adrenaline. Just an adrenaline guy. Do you live on the edge? Yeah. Whatever I do. It's kind of my thing. Live life, we're only here for a while, and then you're dead for a long time. <laughs> Desert rats. Insanity. Pushing any and every edge. It's a dream. This is a dream for me, and I never forget that. I never forget that. I thank God every day that I'm blessed and lucky enough to get all my buddies together and come out and do this. You cannot answer the question why. It doesn't make sense. That is, until you get inside experience it for yourself. Now, if you'd like to find out more about what you can do in Sun River, call the Sun River of Commerce. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. This has been Our Town. From Central Oregon, Sun River, I'm Rick Dancer, 9 News. That's true.